This is the second video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video we will be looking over the menstrual cycle. In this video we will look at how both the egg and sperm cells are adapted for their functions. We will look at the four main stages of the menstrual cycle and finally we will look at how hormones control the menstrual cycle via negative feedback. The human body produces two very specialised sex cells or gametes. We have our sperm here and our egg here. Both of them are adapted to their roles. The function of our sperm is to transport the male's DNA to the female's egg so that the DNA can combine. Sperm are very small and have long tails which enable them to swim to the egg. They also have lots of mitochondria in this midpiece region here. The mitochondria in the middle section provide the energy from respiration that enables the sperm to swim to the egg. Sperm also have an acrosome on the top of the head here, which contains lots of enzymes that enable it to digest its way through the outer cell membrane that surrounds the egg. Finally, sperm cells have a haploid nucleus, which means they only have one copy of each chromosome. Egg cells, on the other hand, are much, much bigger than sperm cells. Their function is to carry the female DNA and to nourish the developing embryo in the early stages. They contain lots of nutrients in this cytoplasm in order to feed the growing embryo. Straight after fertilization, so when a sperm has fused with the egg successfully, the egg membrane then changes the structure in order to stop any more sperm from getting in. This makes sure that the offspring only have the required amount of DNA. And finally, as with the sperm, it contains a haploid nucleus, which means it only has one copy of each chromosome. This means that when both of these cells fuse during fertilisation, the resulting cell has the correct number of chromosomes. The menstrual cycle is a monthly cycle that women go through in order to ovulate. Ovulation is the release of an egg from the ovary. It is approximately a 28-day cycle and is controlled by four hormones. We have FSH, which is follicle-stimulating hormone, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, estrogen and progesterone. Both FSH and LH are produced by the pituitary gland up here, whereas both estrogen and progesterone are produced by the ovaries down here. We will now look at the different stages involved in the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle has four main events. The first of these, which lasts for your first six days, is the menstruation period. This is where the uterus lining breaks down and blood and cells are lost. The second stage, days 7 to 13, is the proliferation stage. This is where the uterus lining is repaired. Then on day 14, just for that single day, we have the ovulation, which is the release of the egg from the ovary. And then the remaining time in the month, days 15 to 28, is known as the postmenstrual period. This is the period of time at which fertilisation can occur and the uterus lining is maintained. We will now look at each of these in more detail. So to start with, we have our days 1 to 6. This is the menstruation period or the bleeding period. In the ovaries, the follicles are currently immature. The follicles are what contains the developing egg. We will look at these in more detail later. Meanwhile, in the uterus, the uterus lining is breaking down and we can see that we have blood leaving. The change in hormone levels are that we have the pituitary gland releasing the FSH. This is follicle stimulating hormone which will cause the follicle to start to develop. Moving on to our second period of time, we have the proliferation period, days 6 to 13. 
In the ovary, the eggs are beginning to develop. This is due to the increased level of FSH. In the uterus, the uterus lining starts to repair. This is the proliferation. This is the building up of the cells. The FSH that was released during the menstruation period has caused a new egg to develop. It also causes oestrogen to release. This oestrogen, once it gets to a certain level, stops FSH. So this is the first example of negative feedback. This prevents more eggs from developing. It then starts to cause luteinizing hormone to release and the uterus lining thickens due to this increased level of oestrogen. Next, we have the ovulation period. This is just day 14. So changes in the ovary. The ovary is now going to release the egg and the uterus lining is going to remain thick. This is caused by this high LH level, which causes the egg to be released into the oviduct. The oviduct is just here. As we've seen so far, changes are occurring in two parts of the body. We've got changes in the ovaries and changes in the uterus lining. These changes are occurring because the hormone levels of the FSH, the LH, the oestrogen and the progesterone keep changing. So what exactly is happening in the ovaries? So what is happening in the ovaries? Well, during menstruation, days one to six, we have immature eggs here. These are inside follicles. During the proliferation period, which is day 7 to 13, the new egg starts to develop inside this growing follicle. And then finally, at ovulation, day 14, the egg will then be released from inside its follicle. So the follicle has grown and then it bursts open, releasing the egg from inside. After day 14, so from day 15 onwards, the empty follicle becomes a corpus luteum, so this yellow body, and then dies. So it's gone through its life cycle. And the egg has been released into the uterus. We will now look at the uterus lining in more detail. So what happens in the uterus lining? Well, after menstruation, which is this period of time here, the uterus lining becomes thicker with blood vessels and it becomes more stable. The reason this is important is that the fertilised egg will implant itself into the uterus lining, so a thick lining is needed to provide a plentiful supply of oxygen and nutrients for the egg to develop. So once the egg has been fertilised, it's going to need to embed itself in the uterus lining and it will have lots and lots of blood and oxygen and nutrients in order to help it survive. We can see that if the egg isn't fertilised and we go through the menstruation period here, the uterus lining quickly gets removed before being built up again. So as a recap as to what has happened so far, we have looked at the menstruation period where the uterus lining is breaking down, the follicles are immature and we have just started to release our FSH. We then go through the proliferation period where we get the lining repairing in the uterus, the eggs begin to develop, FSH has caused the new egg to develop and has caused oestrogen to be released. The oestrogen then turns off the FSH via negative feedback, turns on the production of LH and causes the uterus lining to thicken. Then finally, once we get to day 14, the ovulation period, the uterus lining is now nice and thick. The ovaries are going to release the egg due to the high LH level. But what happens after day 14? So after day 14, it's all about whether we get fertilised or we do not get fertilised. If the egg gets fertilised by a sperm, then the pregnancy will occur. We can see here that one sperm has successfully broken through into the egg. This causes oestrogen and progesterone levels to remain at high levels. So the progesterone is produced in order to maintain the uterus lining. By maintaining the uterus lining, this ensures that menstruation does not occur and this ensures that the uterus lining does not get destroyed. However, if the egg is not fertilised, then simply put, the egg dies, hormone production will stop, 
meaning that we end up with low progesterone levels, which causes the uterus lining to break down and the next menstruation period starts and the cycle will continue. In this video, we have already looked at the four hormones. They are FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, estrogen, LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and progesterone. FSH causes a follicle, which is an egg and its surrounding cells, to mature in one of the ovaries. High levels of FSH also stimulate estrogen production. Oestrogen causes the lining of the uterus to thicken and grow, and a high level of oestrogen stimulates an LH surge whilst also turning off FSH production. This is an example of negative feedback. The LH surge, which is a rapid increase in the amount of LH, stimulates the ovulation at day 14. This is where the follicle ruptures and the egg is released. It also stimulates the remains of the follicle to develop into a structure called a corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes progesterone. It also helps to turn off the production of oestrogen. Finally, we have progesterone. Progesterone maintains the lining of the uterus and inhibits the production of both FSH and LH. When the level of progesterone falls and there is a low oestrogen level, the uterus lining will break down. This low progesterone level allows FSH levels to increase and therefore the whole cycle to start again. However, if the egg is fertilised, this will ensure that progesterone levels remain high and therefore the lining of the uterus will remain thick. Here we have a graph that shows the changing levels of hormones in the menstrual cycle. So we can see that we have the increase in FSH as well as the increase in oestrogen. This causes this spike in LH just before day 14 before we get an increase in progesterone. So we can see the different hormones interacting with each other. Here we have the different stages of the ovulation. We have the egg inside the follicle and then we have the follicle breaking apart to release the egg at ovulation before being converted into a corpus luteum. And then finally at the bottom we have the lining of the uterus. So we can see the menstruation period here as well as the build up of the uterus lining here. It is important to note the alternative spelling of oestrogen on the graph here. Oestrogen without the O is the American spelling. Throughout the menstrual cycle, we have seen examples of negative feedback. This is where the levels of different hormones in the blood are controlled by the levels of other hormones. For example, the level of FSH is controlled by negative feedback. So initially, the pituitary gland is producing FSH. FSH stimulates the ovaries to produce oestrogen. Once the level of oestrogen gets high, oestrogen itself turns off the pituitary gland's production of FSH. So it inhibits this further release from the pituitary gland. After FSH has caused a follicle to mature, negative feedback therefore keeps FSH levels low, which makes sure that no more follicles mature. This prevents multiple pregnancies from occurring at the same time. This concludes this tutorial video on Edexcel B3.2, where we have looked over the menstrual cycle as well as how different gametes are adapted to their roles. In the next video, B3.3, we will look over fertility treatments, sex determination and sex-linked genetic disorders.